All right, sort of beginning where I left off. Uh, we will eventually. Uh, <laughs> yes, I just wanted to mention the in the previous video, um, you see these balloons, and they're affecting each other from a very great distance, which seems like it doesn't really match magnetism. Like magnets seem to wear out in terms of they don't reach that far. Um, but it's got to be kind of understood that the magnetism is being created in kind of a perfect way in the sense that there's not uh, dipole magnets. So it's not like the things that are magnetized or charged have both poles showing. They're kind of turned this way in a sense and spread over a large distance. Um, even though it's a thin material. <clears throat> um, but the catch is, without both poles showing, there's a certain advantage in that when you have both poles of the magnet showing, there's force from the wrong end of the magnet um, coming out of both of those magnets then. And those are repelling instead of attracting, where they would usually just pure attraction or pur pure repulsion. So in a sense, by using monopoles, that is, by creating objects that are charged in such a way as that there's no reveal of the back end of the magnet, the red end or the black end, however you want to have them pointed, um, by creating magnetic objects that are that strictly polarized, um, you um, prevent the dilution of the magnetism over distance, and it stays much stronger over distance and creating large surfaces means that the further away you go is relative to the small magnets equal in a sense that one inch on a scale where the magnets this big is going to be you know ten inches on a scale where the magnets are the size of balloons so just to give some explanation for why static magnetism seems so much stronger than um, hard magnets. It's also a very light thing that you're moving. The balloons are very light. All right, so we should be able to continue from there and uh, reset a little bit behind where I left off, but it should be fine. Microphone should be better, hopefully. Hopefully. You can stick them on the ceiling, or you can stick them on the boards. You can decorate, you can decorate your room that way. Yes. It's very pretty, isn't it? Didn't know I went back this far. But okay. All of that you can do now because of 802. Now, these heavy balloons may be a little bit more difficult. Also, I'm wearing cotton. If you wear nylon or polyester, it's much better. It's much easier to get. Oh, that's good. That's a nice one. I think we need a blue one. I don't even remember this part, actually. There we go. So, you see, friction <laughs> causes electricity. That's, of course, why the silk, when we rub the glass, and the cat fur, we rub the rubber, then we create charge on one. Okay, so again, friction in this case is just forcing atoms um, essentially to bang into each other. And if you do it with things that have a lot of surface area, you're increasing the amount of atoms that are hitting each other. Of course, if you make the glass positively charged, your silk will be automatically negatively charged. When you comb your hair, you may have noticed with dry weather that you hear some cracking noise. Cracking noise means sparks. And you will learn all about sparks in this course, though not today. But you can hear it if you're very quiet. And as you do that, you charge the comb. I can hear the cracking. Interesting. Yeah, I don't remember this part. <laughs> anyway, did we cover this? I don't remember it. Anyway, so I didn't. I don't. I hope we didn't mean to, to lose something like induction that he was going to go over. But anyway, um, I guess we just continue. So the comb is now charged. Probably so am I. And there it comes. See, it's not as good as the glass, but. So again, so is he. He's saying, but in a sense, it just depends on how poor the insulation is between him and ground. So there's lots of parts of him that the tar charge differential has to go through and those in the bottom of your shoes all the way up to the hair, which is not very well grounded to your head. So it just depends on how groundable the thing is, how 
quickly and, and how, how much of a conductor it is, whether the how quickly the charge leaks off. Same idea. If you take your shirt off and you make it and you make it dark in your dormitory and you stand in front of a mirror, an amazing experience. And I'd be happy to do it for you because, but I told you I already wear cotton and it doesn't work with cotton so well. You really have to do it with a nylon shirt. And when you take that nylon shirt off, not only do you hear the cracking, but you actually see the glow of these teeny wee little sparks. You actually are like a light bulb. It is an experiment that you cannot miss. And I would suggest you try that this weekend. And do it with a friend, that's even more fun. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> don't think it would work unless you have like an undershirt, but whatever. We all perhaps remember when you just walk around, do your normal things during the day. There are rugs in rooms and you want to leave the room and you touch the doorknob and you get a shock. There we go. The spark that flies over, it's electricity. Even when you touch a person, you sometimes feel this shock. Right, so this shark, the shock doesn't go flying off too easily. So this idea, again, of an electric field, the spark doesn't just fly off. The charge isn't just lost. It isn't just flying through some field that it can easily perpetrate through. It has to wait till atoms show up so it can exchange the pressure with the atoms. When you cook and you take saran wrap of these rolls, the damn stuff just doesn't want to come off because as you roll it off, there's friction and it gets charged and it often gets crumbled up. It's very bad. So it gets charged, but that charge is in a sense magnetism, so it's stuck through magnetic effect, the same magnetic effect that's holding the atoms together. So at minimum, <laughs> we should agree that the effect that's holding those pieces of plastic together is the same effect that's holding a proton to an electron. It's being compelled towards each other. Um, and again, I'm arguing because of a real force. Again, you're just doing a gravity experiment. It's all gravity in the, in the end. And the other forces, the other two forces, and understand they there's no field until they exist. So without the force, there's no field. So the magnetic field is just gravity polarized. So it's just the force of gravity now altered in the sense that you've taken the, the, the electron force and bent it one way and the proton force and bent it another way. And uh, photons, again, are just gravity except uh, and it's only the electron force, and you've created a circumstance where it's bouncing. It has been bouncing at a regular rate, and it leaves at that frequency, that bounce rate. And um, that's your photon. That's your electromagnetic radiation. So it's not electromagnetic. It's basically created by the pressure of the electrons. So the label should be something reflecting the origin of the photon, which is electron pressure. Very difficult to handle it. You've all experienced that. Also, cellophane around boxes with chocolate, the same thing happens. As you take it off, you charge it, whether you like it or not. I now want to do an experiment, and I need a volunteer. I need a student who actually is wearing Preferably not all cotton, but I think, Simon, you have a beautiful, wonderful nylon parker. So if you are willing to sacrifice a little bit for the sake of science and come over here and sit down here, just relax. Make sure that your feet are off the ground. OK. So what I'm going to do now, Simon, I'm going to beat you with a cat fur. <laughs> And as I beat you with cat fur, you will get charged. And since I don't want you to be the only person who suffers under this experiment, I will also stand on an insulated stool. So if you become, for instance, positively charged, I don't know what... 
Uh, I don't know what that was about. Okay, it's working now. Um, not one of the best demonstrations, a little cartoony. Um, so again, it's just demonstrating the same principle that you can create charge through uh, lots of things. You don't need cat fur and you don't need this and you don't need that. You just need this friction thing in the right circumstance um, uh, where you really couldn't do it with two conductors because then it'll all drain out so you can't uh, collect any charge but uh, so, so many kinds of insulators so negative I will get the other amount of charge so we share in the charge and as I beat you you will charge up more and more and I will charge up more and more and then we will have to convince the class that um, that we are both charged and we will do that in a way that will be hopefully rather convincing I um, let me just start beating you a little bit <laughs> to make you feel at home we know each other right okay now of course as I mentioned to you these experiments work well when it is dry so again understand now the reason why he's gonna lose charge is because he's creating a deception essentially by moving the ping pong paddles he's creating an illusion that he has pressure but he doesn't really have any extra pressure and so when he averages with something else the average is going to be higher because the other guy's going to think the average is higher and so he's going to go down based on that higher average He's not going to have the pressure he was supposed to have. So when the averaging happens, he's going to have to give some money back because he didn't have it to start with, so to speak. And so if you are too wet, it won't work. But let's see, if you sweat a little bit too much, then it doesn't work too well. So you ready? I have here in my hand a neon flash tube. And although we don't know yet what voltage is, because we will learn about that in this course, to get a good flash out of this, you need about uh, a few thousand volts. And so we will see, and we'll make it dark shortly, and I will hold the flashlight, the flash <coughs> light in one hand, the neon discharge tube, and then Simon will touch it on the other side. And if we succeed it, then you may see some light. Simon, look at me first. Don't touch it yet because we're going to make it all the way dark. You know? Okay, so, um, yes, so it's there's just, obviously, one is now covered with atoms that are pressurized uh, and one is depressurized. And now there's a voltage difference, a pressure difference, that simple. And the electricity, the pressure will move. And when the pressure moves, it's going to distort the atoms that it's going to move through causing them to become magnetic and in the case of neon disturb them enough to uh, break them essentially pieces off of them and um, cause photons so where it is it's there okay make it darker Marcos touch it touch it okay thank you can we have some light thank you very much Uh, and the other 802, yeah, he doesn't do the neon thing, so it's not quite as impressive. Or they don't film it, but one or the other. Equal charges repel each other. I've shown that, the demonstration with the balloons. Here we have an instrument which is called the Van de Graaff. It's named after Professor Van de Graaff, who invented it. He was an MIT professor. And this instrument, which I will not discuss in any detail now, but you will understand it later on in the course. I'll tell you all about it later. Just think of this instrument as a super amber rod. And although we don't know yet what voltage is, I mentioned already the 20,000 volts between Simon and me, in this instrument you have to think in terms of several hundred thousand volts. So this instrument is not without danger. But that of course makes it more exciting to work with it. So it's a super amber rod and what I will do first now is to put some confetti on top 
And when we turn on the Van de Graaff, the confetti may at first go to the charge dome, it is already on top of it, and when it picks up some of the charge, it will then spread out because it, it will repel. So this is another key to these experiments is the humidity in the room and all of that because, again, the pathway that the electricity is seeking is, again, any atoms. So the confetti's light, the uh, atoms will pressurize on it depending on whether it's at a distance or whether it touches the surface. So if there's lots of distance, the confetti's on top of another piece of confetti, on top of another piece of confetti, that piece of confetti might charge opposite um, the surface and the ones that touch will become the same voltage as the Vendigraph and then they're going to repel because they're going to have the same charge I mean the same surface magnetism um, and um, but they don't really have anywhere to go in the sense that the, they can't go until they start hitting atoms so it's again the same you know the, the electricity of the, the, the atomic pressure still can't be neutralized in any direction. So they just fly. They don't go in a particular way. They're not like iron filings around a... Well, it might be a little bit like it. I shouldn't say it. Okay. I won't say it, but they, they might be a little bit like iron filings around uh, a magnet. Let's work. Let's so let's get some light on there which will make it a little bit better to see this probably could be louder mm. let me put some of this on top it's just regular confetti pieces of paper all right now all i have to remember is how to start the Most of the action has already occurred. I will put a little bit more on. <laughs> if you see sparks, don't worry. Yes. <laughs> put some more on. Nothing left for the second class. <laughs> Make it perhaps a little darker. No, nah, that's too dark. Okay, we'll try it once more, I'll give it a zap. So look at the confetti on top. There it goes. <laughs> so pretty much just the balloon effect, just again, just demonstrating that when the things make contact, they have the same charge, so they become like two electrons, and they fly apart from each other, or two protons, and fly apart from each other. So, I would argue that the only thing really to take from this is that as an understanding, that as their pressures are, things, atoms with equal pressure don't like each other much, you could argue, that that's the, the byproduct um of the point uh, because it doesn't matter whether it's a high pressure or a low pressure if you have the same pressure you don't tend to hit each other you tend to hit each other if you have differentials in your pressure but again that's that differential is more probably about the shape of the atom but uh, you know in theory it could be just this effect of the fact that you have the nucleus and you have the electrons and as you move the electrons in and you move the electrons out you unequalize the distance perception so if the electron and the proton start off different sizes and I move them towards you I can find a point where they're the same size but if I move the electron further this size gets bigger than this, and if I move the electron closer, this gets bigger than this. And that's really what's happening. And so when atoms have 
the same pressure, um, they uh, <laughs> you would think they would perceive that as uh, nothing, really, right? I have to think of it's always about the electrons that are going to be the, the players. So I have to think about that. But that's what this has something to do with. I think it's quite convincing. Some of the confetti will stay there. Well, that's for reasons that it's not a good conductor. And so that if first sucked in, and if it doesn't get charged of the Van de Graaff, then it will not spread out. All right. So now, let's try for the first time to be a little bit more quantitative. So, as I was saying, when the things have the same charge, the... <laughs> yeah. The electron is still stronger when you're, you're closer. So when you move closer, it gets stronger than the proton from a distance. So as I... When, if I equalize the size of two things uh, by doing this, but I move this closer to you, this gets bigger. So there's two ways things change in their size. So the point is, is even the neutral atom becomes very attractive, I mean very repulsive at proximity. So as you get closer, the electrons get bigger and bigger. The protons get bigger, but not bigger by the same percentage that this is getting bigger. And um, so you can see that the electrons would see just electron, 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 and they repel. So the electrons are really controlling most of the action. If I take two charges, and we use in general, we use for charge the symbol Q. So here we have Q1. And here we have Q2. And let's say they are separated by a distance r. And the. So I might as well point out he does do a very neat little chalk trick. So he learned that he could push chalk forward you know, in his, if he loosely held it and pushed it into its nose, that it would vibrate in his hand and create a dotted line. He really became quite proficient at it. <laughs> yeah. So there's no trick. He's not using a tool. He's just using his fingers, and he's just learned how to do it very well, very reliably. Unit vector in the direction from 1 to 2, I call that R roof 1, 2. The roof stands for unit vector. If these charges are equal, both minus or both plus, then they will repel each other. And so here there is a force, F, which I call 1, 2. This is the force on 2 due to number 1. And since action equals minus reaction, force here is to 1, equal in magnitude, but 180 degrees in opposite direction. Coulomb, the French physicist... I don't really like that way of drawing it, so it just confuses things. It's obviously there's two forces that are... Um, the, the force from Q1 actually goes to Q2 and says and pushes it. And the force from Q2 actually goes to Q1 and pushes it. The forces never interact. We did a lot of research on this in the 19th, 18th century, actually. Coulomb found the following relationship that the force is proportional to the product of the two charges. So it's Q1 times Q2 times a constant, which nowadays we call Coulomb's constant, K, divided by the distance between these charges squared. Right, so we're back to the inverse square uh, strengthening and weakening of a force, which is the same as gravity. And it really just has to do with the fact that the force doesn't move in laser beams to the two charges. The force spreads out in both dimensions, so it weakens uh, by that product. And it is in direction 
of the unit vector that goes from 1 to 2. This is the force on number 2 due to 1. So understand, once you get inside the atom, you get rid of that r squared. So you're not dividing by the distance squared. You're not dividing by anything. Because you basically have a ping pong paddle with a thing that's going just back and forth. So if the ball went in all kinds of directions, you could sort of understand that the force is going to be fairly weak because it's going to keep going in some other direction. And notice that this equation is sign sensitive. Because if Q1 and Q2 are both negative, the force is in, the force is in this direction. And if they're both positive, it's also in this direction, as I have it. However, if, the, if one is positive and one is negative, you get minus this direction, so this force flips over, and that one then obviously also flips over. In the SI units, in this course, we will use for the unit of charge the Coulomb, named after this great man. One Coulomb charge is a horrendous amount of charge, more than you will ever see in your lifetime. Right, which doesn't make it very useful. So I don't know why they don't put these things into uh, everything into a unit of weight or pressure or force and have everything reduced to that, like a horsepower or something or a watt or whatever. Um, because it's all energy in a sense and <laughs> there should be one <clears throat> common understandable amount of it. We normally work with micro coulombs, sometimes even less than that. The charge of one proton, which is exactly the same as the charge of one electron, is approximately 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulomb. So one coulomb is something like 6 times 10 to the 18 protons or electrons if the charge is negative. This constant K in SI units is 9 times 10 to the 9th. So they might as well have just multiplied that times the constant to start off and called it coulombables, <laughs> you know, or something. And that it would at least fix the 10 to the 19 number by making it a 10 to the 10 number instead. And the unit you can find out because you know that this is Newtons, this is Coulomb squared, and this is square meters, so the unit is Newton, square meters, Newtons, square meters, divided by square Coulomb, but that's not so important. No one ever thinks of it that way. Nobody could think of it that way, so that's the whole problem, is nobody can think about it in terms of, well, how many watts is that, or, you know, uh, how, do I, how do I measure it if I put it on a scale? How many inches does it weigh, this charge force? For historical reasons. If you tied a string to the charge, so it so you could feel how much it wants to move, yeah, we should be able to measure that in something rational. <laughs> you know. Which may at times be a pain in the neck for you. We write for k one divided by four pi epsilon zero. So this comes up a lot, the 4 pi epsilon 0. So they write 4 pi epsilon 0 even though they know the constant already has a number. And I guess part of that is is because they want to get, they want to cross out pi's wherever they can and so any anything they can reduce to something that has a pi in it and they're going to like it because then they can do a lot of crossing out. But I don't know why else they would take a number they have is already explicit it was whatever it was times 10 to the 10th or 9th. It was whatever, right? 9 times 10 to the 9th. They already know what it is. So, so why, why, why put the, the jibber-jabber in there if you already know what the number is? Right? I don't like it. So that's what they call doing good math, is taking a number you already know and turn it into this 4 pi epsilon 0 stuff, whatever that even, I don't even know what an epsilon zero means. Nothing magic about that. It's just a historical reason. And so one divided by four pi epsilon zero is nine times ten to the ninth. That's all that matters. Oh, well, yeah, I think it does matter that somehow you have a preference for not putting the actual number in and instead want to put in this gibberish when you could just put the actual number in.
9 times 10 to the 9th. Why don't you just put 9 times 10 to the 9th there, then? This epsilon 0 has a name. It's called the permittivity of free space. Right. So, again, it's, it's the permittivity of free space, which doesn't exist. There's no permittivity. So, it's a 0, essentially. Which, so, it's 4 pi times 0. So, that doesn't even make sense. I don't know what the 0 below means. So, it's whatever. But fine. But you can forget about that. It's not important to me. Well, it's sort of important, but you're just putting another constant in. So obviously the epsilon zero is a constant. The permittivity of empty space is always constant, so the number is always the same number. Four pi times this permittivity of empty space number, which is the true constant here. You're essentially saying that's the constant, not the k. And again, you already know the number, so why not put it in the formula? Y epsilon zero. Notice that there is a clear parallel with gravity. Newton's. Right. The clear parallel is the R squared. That's all you, you're dividing by R squared. Every time you divide by R squared, well, you've got something to do with radial force from a sphere. Law of gravity, that the force, which in that case is always attracting, gravity never repels, is the product of two masses, and then you have here the gravitational constant, and again you have the distance square. So there is an enormous parallel between the two. It's a great beauty that electricity acts in a way that is very parallel to the way that gravity works. So again, it isn't electricity, it's charge, which is basically a description of electrons and protons. So it's a, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's not a description of electricity. It's a description of magnetism. And um, clearly, magnetism is just gravity, as I've stated, segregated by color. It's a tiny difference. But it's a tiny difference that makes all the difference. So the amount, the gravity, if I was a magnet, so if I'm not a magnet, gravity is going into me from both sides. It's going from me up and down, and obviously there's a differential because of all the crap below me has absorbed some energy, so I am not getting hit by the energy the people on in Fuji. The people in Fuji are absorbing energy moving towards the center of the Earth. When they absorb that energy, it doesn't hit me in my feet. Therefore, there's more little bits hitting me from the top, and I move down. From side to side, there's no Fuji people, so I'm getting hit by the same amount from both sides. But when I'm getting hit, I'm also radiating it back. So I give back what I get because I'm sort of at equilibrium. Except going up and down, I'm not at equilibrium, I'm moving down. Um, I'm being pushed back up again, but I, I'm just, I am moving down and I'm being pushed back up again. I can feel the chair pushing me back up. Anyway, so <clears throat> um, the, the force is conserved in the sense it's either reflected or it goes through. Um, and um, I don't want to make that relevant. So if I'm not a magnet and the force is coming into me, gravity, it's all mixed. It's red and black, red and black, all mixed up. And it's all mixed up coming out. And it's all mixed up going in and it's all mixed up coming out. But if I'm a magnet, then it comes in all mixed up, but it leaves black all going this way and red all going that way. The same amount of force that went in is going out. It's going out segregated. And that's how magnets are formed, are made. And that's what that equation is describing. If I added a third charge, for instance here, Q3, and if now I want to know what the force is on Q2, then I use the superposition principle, which we've used many times in 801. All right, so there is no superposition principle except that the forces don't interact with each other. The force goes all the way to the other charges, and you have to calculate it that way. And we say, okay, the net force on number two is the force due to number one plus the force from number three. If number three, if this is positive and this is positive and this were negative, then this force would be in this direction, F1, F3, 2, and then the net force on number 2 
would be the vectorial sum of these two. Is it obvious that the superposition principle works? The vectorial sum he didn't draw, which would have been some other net force line. <laughs> not at all. It's not at all obvious. Do we believe in it? Yes, we do. Why do we believe in it? Because it's consistent with all experiments that we have done. Right. So when he says superposition, again, he, the real point is, is superposition means is that the, the forces aren't interacting. They're not bouncing off each other's forces. So the forces aren't relevant. The, the real point is, is the force has to get to the, the, the charge, the mass. And each one applies a force that's completely independent of everything else that's happening. So the force applied by this thing can't be nullified by B or A. And none of them can nullify each other's forces. So you essentially just add up what they have because nothing, can, and nothing gets nullified. And then you get a net product. But the superposition principle, which is very powerful, is really not a matter of course. But it works. We can always use it, and we will. If you compare 801 with 802, thereby comparing electricity with gravity, so again, this isn't really electricity, okay? <laughs> Charge um, is more. And it has to do with the fact that, again, when you charge it, you're changing the distances of the electrons from the protons. You're changing what the atom or the thing looks like. And that, that is essentially a magnetic feature, not an electric feature. The electricity is... Strictly speaking, again, the pressure that changed the shape of the atom. And electricity can be transferred, but it's the effect of that electro the, the effect of electrifying an atom is to magnetize it, essentially. Change its charge. We'll see that electric forces are way more powerful than gravitational forces. And the way I can best show you that is by taking... So this is just an illustration of the point that if you segregate this gravity force, it'll become much more powerful. And of course, if you convert the force to just a single photon bouncing between two electrons that no longer obeys the inverse square law, of course it becomes a lot more powerful. So if you can... If you could convert the sun into a laser beam and point it at the earth, so all the energy of the sun is hitting the earth, you would obviously say that's a very powerful force. So that's the difference, is the force is how it's manifested. So as you get to the macro world, gravity manifests much more directed, and that's why it's much more, it appears to be much more powerful, like 10 times 30 times <laughs> to more powerful. Two protons, which are a distance d apart. Here is a proton, and here is a pro proton, and they are separated by a distance d. They repel each other. And the force by which they repel each other is, of course, extremely easy to calculate. We know Coulomb's law, that law is called after Coulomb. And so the force, the electric force with which they repel each other, this is just the magnitude now of the force, is the charge of the proton, which is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, but I have to square that. I have to multiply it by Coulomb's constant, which is 9 times 10 to the 9. An amazing number when you think about it, squaring this huge number. <laughs> you know, it's just, whoa, insane number. Times. And I divide it by d squared. That's the electric force. If I want to know the gravitational force, which is the force with which they attract each other, these are repelling forces, but I just want magnitudes here. All right, so this is sort of cheating the argument, but this is a mass argument in a sense, because obviously the sun creates more gravitational potential by increasing its density or mass. So when you're making gravity, mass matters. When you're being affected by gravity, mass doesn't matter. 
So, um, and it's, it's essentially a nuclear force when you're being affected by it. Gravity affects your atoms. It doesn't affect you as a whole thing. It just affects the electrons and the protons, essentially. But the way it's being produced is different. So, um, uh, it always hits every electron with the same amount of force. So, the more atoms you have, the more electrons, the more protons, then the more force you absorb and it's always proportional so that's why things move the same way in gravity no matter what their weight is is because one is getting hit or is absorbing a lot more force and the reason why there is a lot more force is because the sun is providing the opportunity for that differential in pressure all right um yeah so I, I think it would be better to focus on this as a magnetic effect rather than an electrical effect because it's really not electrical. Then I have to take the mass of the proton, which is 1.7 times 10 to the minus 27. I have to square that. Remember, m1 times m2 times the gravitational constant. The gravitational constant in SI units is 6.7 times 10 to the minus 11, and I divide that by d squared. Right. <clears throat> well, it should be r squared, but who's counting? If now I compare the electric force with the gravitational force, so I divide one by the other, notice that the d cancels. They both have d squared downstairs. And so you will easily be able to show that this ratio is roughly 10 to the 36. So the distance isn't what's supposed to be used in the gravitational equation, so I don't really understand why he did it that way. Um, you're using the thickness, the density of the object, essentially. You're measuring the r is the, the radius of the sun in the example of the sun. So um, that's not really the gravitational equation. So comparing those two equations is cheating a little bit because you're, not, you're dividing by the, de the, the, the distance, the total distance, instead of by squared, rather than the distance of the charge squared. It's going to make gravity a lot weaker being being divided by that much bigger number. So the electric force is 36 orders of magnitude more potent than the gravitational attraction. Well, by this way you did this equation, that, that would make it sure. Because you sort of, like again, you sort of cheated in my opinion. I don't know why this distance squared is in here when it's supposed to just be the radius squared. This teaches you some respect, perhaps, for 802. If these were the only forces that acted on the protons, and you bring them in the nucleus, which has a size of only 10 to the minus 12 centimeters, so let's understand, inside the atom, all of this, in this dividing by distance stuff is, is fundamentally useless because it really doesn't matter how far away the distance is in the sense that you're not going to lose photons to other places. The distance just changes the um, period, the, um, the amount of hits per second. So it clearly reduces with distance but it reduces for fundamentally a completely different reason. It, it reduces because of the slowness of the speed of light, you could argue. Then the acceleration that... Or the consistency of the speed of light. The fact that as you increase distance, it takes light longer to go back and forth. Therefore, there's less energy. The more distance you create, the less energy. The proton will experience is the electric force divided by the mass of the proton, F equals ma, basis of eta 1. And if you take this electric force, when you make d 10 to the minus 12 centimeters, which is 10 to the minus 14 meters, and you calculate this ratio, you will find that it is 26 orders of magnitude higher than the gravitational acceleration on Earth. 26. So, so again, these, I, I would just argue that that's a false comparison. It's clear that gravity is not as strong as magnetism, but again, the argument would be that you're not really being making the fair comparison here in terms of trying to demonstrate that. And double argument would be made 
is the forces are not irradiating in the same way so it's of no consequence the force between electrons is not spherically radiating which orders of magnitude higher so you wonder what the hell holds the nucleus together if there is such a tremendous force on these protons well what is holding them together are the nuclear forces which we do not fully understand okay so that's the one he doesn't fully understand so maybe I'll draw this one just to try the drawing thing I should be able to do it amazingly um, in this thing just have to remember uh, me no, I don't want me I want the video camera to pop ahead there it is so it actually works amazing and that's no good though so I have to insert this to fix that annoying thing all right so that's not terrible we can live with it I think um, it's better, but yeah, it's still not right. But anyway, um, we'll just go for it. So what he's getting to here is that inside the nucleus, the protons are rather large, and um, they have a lot of repulsive potential. So they're like big magnets, uh, big monopoles. So they're the big south ends, and the little electrons are the little north ends that make up this atom that's a, 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 a magnet. And so the protons have a lot of hostility. So there's a lot of s pressure pushing them apart. They would want to be at a very far distance from each other, much further than the electrons would want to be. And here the electrons are way out here, um, 10,000 times further, you know, ten, uh, just, just a very, <laughs> very far out here. Compared to the size of this nucleus, they're 10,000 times further away than the diameter of the nucleus. So there's no reason for these protons to be stuck in this tiny speck. I mean, the nucleus is a speck um, in, in the size of the atom, just a little speck. So why are these protons so close together? And he's just said they don't have a clear explanation. They just call it a nuclear force, a strong force, a this or that. Well, what's really happening is that within these protons are neutrons and the neutrons have a catch and the neutrons catch is that the neutron is a proton and an electron so essentially and the electron has to be sort of understood as being the same size volume if not weight of the neutron and so what's happening is the red force is going to leak out this electron so where this the ping pong ball is going back and forth because it's can't it can't escape here all the red force goes out perpendicularly from these protons so there is no bouncing back and forth and any black force will end up going you know that might happen to get in here uh, there's no real way for it to do that but anyway it's going to leak out this way well there is a way the field is always hitting all this stuff so there's always the chance encounter where something from de from you know from Pluto a little bit of energy will come and it'll hit this proton and it'll go this way and bounce off this electron and bounce back out here and then bounce this way and bounce that way so the geometry you can sort of get a feel for I wish these colors were more distinct um, you can get a feel for how geometry is so important because you can have all kinds of ways that something can get trapped going back and forth you can get trapped going back and forth from this proton to say if there was another if there was another proton here you know illustrate um, sorry wrong draw it the wrong way if there's another proton here you could sort of understand it then the <coughs> wrong color dot uh, the electron make it a line you can understand now this energy can leak out this way it leaks out this way it could hit this proton it could bounce this way it could bounce this way bounce that way so there's lots of arrangements, but the overall tendency is going to be for it to leave one way. I guess that I could bring up surfaces just for a second, just to illustrate this maybe. It might be worth doing, I don't know. We'll see. So if I have electrons on the surface because something's been charged, let's call it, and the protons are deeper in, um, you can sort of understand that a red force would come in 
Oops, wrong color again. <laughs> okay, so we know the electron force would bounce off. But a red force could hit this electron, and it could go this way. And then when it hits this electron, it could go this way. And now it's going to bounce back this way. And then it would bounce, it could go this way. But no matter where it goes, it'll never go deeper into the atom. So the red force eventually will be reflected out. And the point is, is in a magnet, that reflection is pushed all the way to one end. And that's kind of how the force is segregated. One end is slowly pushing all the red force one way, and the electrons are slowly pushing all the black force the other way. I mean, the, the protons are pushing the black force the other way. And that creates the segregation. So I mm, hope that was helpful. Like I said, the colors really aren't distinct enough. It's a lot of light. It really should be better than this. I mean, damn. I guess this filters the problem, so I have to figure out some way to get rid of that. I mean, it's set on the right frequency for the light, so I just have to figure out maybe I have to use a different kind of light or something. Yeah, if I put my hand in there, I can get rid of it. <laughs> yeah, to figure out a different filter. Maybe this magnifying glass. Let's see how that works anyway. This is an experiment. Oh, yes, you can make things a little bigger. Yeah, it's very nice. All right, so enough of the drawing. And uh, that means I have to go back down or up? Down, I would imagine. Yes. Okay, got that right, too. Well, we're rolling right along. That didn't work, but I didn't have much hope that it would. But thank goodness, the nuclear forces are not part of 802, so I'll leave that alone for now. So what holds our world together? Well, on the nuclear <clears throat> scale, and to the minus 12 centimeters... So I probably should have said, which I didn't in the illustration, that again, the low pressure, the fact that all the pressure leaks out means the protons can get incredibly close. Because as long as there's an electron between them, they get really close. And the same thing would happen to an electrons. If there was two electrons, I put a proton in between them, the electrons can get much closer to each other technically. Even though there's something between them, they can get much closer. <clears throat> if you were to use the moon as an example, if you put a moon on the other side of the Earth, and this isn't true for gravity, the idea would be that now the two moons could be much closer together. Uh, oh, that didn't work. i got to remember, do not use the mouse. This very important are the nuclear forces. On an atomic scale, up to thousands of kilometers, it's really electric forces that hold our world together. All right, so again, it's, uh, you know, this is just, maybe it's just semantics, but I mean, it's really not electric. Electric is just pressure. The fact that charges are different, electrons are oppositely charged than protons, is the source of magnetism. It isn't the source of electricity. The pressure between the electrons is electricity. So I think it's an important distinction. But on a much larger scale, planets and stars in the galaxy, it is gravity that holds our world together. And now you may say, oh, that's very inconsistent with what you just told us. Because didn't you tell us that D cancels if you compare gravity with electricity? Yes, but keep in mind that most objects in the universe have only a very small amount of charged per unit mass. So again, he says the, the Ds cancel, but I mean, they really don't because those are the wrong formulas. One's a D formula, one's an R, 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 R radius formula. So again, it just seems to me breaking the concept. Either use R squared in both cases, but I don't know why you use the D squared. The Earth and Mars have each a charge of about 400,000 coulombs. The gravitational force between them is therefore about 17 orders of magnitude larger than the electric force. So, so that's how it's just so insignificant to make comparisons between, between these two things and call them forces. There's no electric force in the first place. It has to be in the form of magnetism. That's what the Earth has. Is it's a little bit magnetic. Um, <laughs> and um, there's only one force, technically, and it's the gravity. And you can filter it. And by filtering it, that is, by segregating its two elements into proton and electron energy, 
you can make that energy a lot more effective in affecting atoms. <clears throat> but they really shouldn't be compared to each other because although there are two forms of the same thing, they function very different. The reason why gravity works is because things move. Things are pushed with it. They move their location. And when they move their location, they absorb energy. And by absorbing the energy, the energy doesn't get where it was going. So I don't know how many times I can do this analogy, but if something's stationary here, and there's force coming in both ways, and the force is allowed to move this, so this is the only way it can move. Something has to push it. While this is moving, this is moving so much slower than the force. So the force is always moving the speed of light. So the force bits were hitting it at the speed of light. They're not going to go where they should be. So while this is moving really slow, the force should have been way over here by now. So anything way over here is going to be saying, nothing's hitting me. Oh, i got to get in the image probably. But it's, it's like... The stuff, the, the equalizing force never gets to him. He, he was in balanced force. Well, now I put something in the way that moved a little. And by it moving a little bit, it absorbed a force that should have hit him. And it's not hitting him anymore. So he's going to move into that change, that difference. And when he moves, he's absorbing energy. He's being pushed by the higher. The 10 force over here, there's a 9 force here. Let's say there's 10 and 10. Two things in here. One of them moves. You can understand there was 10 force on this side, but on this side, after it moves, there's only a 9 force. So this one's getting hit by a 9 and a 10. And it's going to say, I'm going to move into the 9. 10's bigger. Or when it moves into the 9, it turns this into a 9. Just like the atoms balance, the force is balancing. So now, now this one is going to let less force hit over here. And so <laughs> this thing is going to move. And then this one. And they induce the movement in each other through that process. So gravity isn't magnetism. Even though our immediate surroundings are dominated by electric forces, including your own body for that matter, the behavior of the universe on a large scale is dictated by gravity. All right, so let's understand. It's dictated by magnetism. What's holding your body together is magnetism, not electricity. Electricity has to do with the nerves transferring pressure, your heart muscle, having its, uh, you know, the pressure moving across at a, a, a field of atomic, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, atomic pressure, uh, electron pressure moves across your heart and causes it to beat. So there's some electricity inside of us. But what's holding the atoms together <laughs> is magnetism. The charge difference between uh, uh, electrons and protons and that charge difference, they are the monopoles of magnetism. The electron is a monopole of magnetism. The proton is a monopole of magnetism. We will use various instruments to measure charge in a quantitative way. And one of the instruments that you will see, we will use it often in the lectures that are to come, is called an electroscope. It's a very simple instrument. In general, it is just a conducting rod. It could be aluminum, metal. And at the end are two pieces of tinsel, two pieces of aluminum foil. Well, they usually use gold to do it right, but yeah, OK. <laughs> and often there is a nice knob here. And if I touch this with a charged object, then because this can conduct electricity, this can conduct the fire, as defined by Benjamin Franklin, if I touch it with an object which is positively charged, then this object will become positively charged. If I touch it with an object which is negatively charged, it will become negatively charged. And you see now here, these two very light pieces of aluminum foil will repel each other. And so you will see that this shows a certain angle. And the more charge there is, the larger that angle. So that gives us a way of doing some quantitative measurements. There are other electroscopes which are not too different there's one central rod and they would have one leaf hanging there and when you charge that one up then this leaf will go out and if it charges more it will go out even further the trick is is it'll do that for negative or positive charge so it won't tell you 
which charge you have. So it'll do the same thing for either, if I understand correctly. And so all you can do is you can show that you had a negative charge on it by hitting it with a positive charge, and then the leaf will go in. But it doesn't say overtly whether it's positive or negative, whether it's low pressure or high pressure. The fact is, <sighs> yeah. Again, we're back to this argument about why ground has no effect, but that's one unique circumstance where you have an equal distance, where I have taken two objects of different size and placed them in such a way as they look to be the same size. That is only one position an atom can have. Everything else isn't that, and that's the neutral. I don't have an electroscope now here, but what I want you to see that if I charge myself up and I hold in my hand these Christmas tree tinsels, that in a way, if I get enough charge on me, then these tinsels will spread out. It's an idea that immediately follows from the fact that you get a certain amount of charge. So he's going to do a little theater here with the Vendegraaff. It's okay. Charge, whether it's negative charge for me or whether I'm positively charged, that doesn't make any difference. These tinsels will spread out. And of course, the best way I can do that is by charge myself with the vinegar. And as I said earlier, experiments of this nature are not entirely without risk. And so there's always the possibility, of course, that I don't survive this demonstration. <laughs> but don't worry, because in that case, there will be someone else who will lecture 802. Except, he is not likely to show this demonstration again. <laughs> so you might as well take a close look, because this may be the only time you'll ever see it. So I will give you some nice light on the Venn graph. More theater than I would like, actually. <laughs> Let's just get to it. Yeah. Just don't have to turn it into a, a riveting edge-of-our-seat experience. And it's always a scary moment for me. Sleepless nights about the Vendegraaff. <laughs> Am I going to turn it on, Marcos, or you have uh, the courage to turn it on? You will turn it on? Okay, hold it, Marcos. This is too close for comfort. You ready? He sort of treats Marcos as a flunky, so I'm sure Marcos wouldn't really mind if he was the guy who pulled the switch that, you know, ah, I got him. I finally got my revenge. Are you nervous? See you. So look at the pencils and try not to look at me, please. Go ahead. I am now a living electroscope. <laughs> if, the, um, if the weather is cooperating today... So the point is, is as much as it looks like <clears throat> charge is radiating from him, the real reason why he's surviving is because the charge isn't getting away. It's not going through some electric field somewhere. It's stuck inside of him. <clears throat> and it's really the movement of charge that'll might kill you the volt you need the current without the current the electric charge you know 200,000 volts doesn't mean anything if it doesn't have any weight to it there isn't a lot of it moving and if I had long hair you might even see that my hair would start to act like an electroscope we can try that too I don't you throw it <laughs> So, so the individual hairs are essentially cr 
creating little like iron filing magnets of all the same magnetic polarity and they're just repelling each other so they're just trying to get away from each other because they all have a little bit of magnetism that's exactly the same orientation and that exact same orientation means they have to repel I think that'll do it okay well this weekend make sure you take this nylon shirt off in front of the mirror and enjoy your enjoy the experiments at home I don't know why you're taking a shirt off how you can see in the mirror so that's the tricky part too but whatever so, whatever don't try this ever <laughs> see you Friday so applause I never hear any of that anyway so um, call this number two moving right along so until next time and such next edition next version no next edition I guess they're edition numbers I don't know they'll be numbered one two three four five six seven so on now we're done okay <laughs> yeah, had to get that extra applause in there oh shit I never put the video oh I didn't yeah that was the video it just went black yeah thought I made an error sorry for the nasty words here and there anyway till next time such